Brothers and sisters, welcome to our June Into the Deep session. Into the Deep, as you know, is a monthly series of talks and lectures for seeking disciples. And we thank you for being here with us tonight, especially after a long and hot day. And so for you to be inside, being present to this session, we're very grateful for your participation tonight and throughout the year. So thank you very much. My name is Sister Angela Marie Castellani. I'm the coordinator for Adult Faith for and Catechesis for the Archdiocese. And with me tonight from the Ministries and Outreach Office is Raisa Jose helping with the technology needs uh, as we continue to celebrate the year of St. Joseph and approach Canada Day next week on July 1st. I would like to open this session in prayer. And in a particular way, I would like to ask you to join me in praying the fourth day of the Novena to St. Joseph. Many of you may have signed up and have been receiving uh, emails every day, emails that present you with a reflection, a prayer, and a, a call to action. So the Novena is our own way in Canada. It was presented to us by the bishops of Canada, and the Archbishop has asked us to come together as an archdiocese to pray this Novena to implore St. Joseph's intercession for the welfare of the entire country for the many needs of our society, and in particular for those who have passed away due to the COVID-19 virus. So the novena began on Tuesday and it will end on Wednesday, June 30th. And on July 1st, there will be a mass at the cathedral with an act of entrustment to St. Joseph, the patron of Canada. So I will begin reading the reflection with and for you. And the reflection is taken from Patris Corde, the Holy Father, uh, apostolic letter uh, that introduced uh, the celebration of the year of St. Joseph on December 8, 2019. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Even through St. Joseph's fears, God's will, his history, and his plan were at work. Joseph then teaches us that faith in God includes believing that he can work even through our fears, our frailties, and our wickedness. He also teaches us that amid the temptest, temptest of life, we must never be afraid to let the Lord steer our course. At times, we want to be in complete control, yet God always sees the big picture. And the prayer is for peace and unity in our country. St. Joseph, tender and loving father, we ask that you intercede with your son, the savior of the world, that the people of Canada may know the peace which comes from God and be always united in fraternal spirit. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. And our call to action, explore opportunities to contribute to the building of peace and unity in our country and commit to engaging in one of them. So for tonight, we have the great privilege and I have the great joy of introducing you to Father Mark Gazen. Father Mark is part of the congregation of St. Basil and he is um, a Vancouverite. So he um, graduated with his high school diploma from Pont Grey in Vancouver. And then Father went on and studied at UBC where he met the Basilian Fathers at St. Mark's College. Then in 1984, the Basilians asked him to teach Spanish in algebra at a high school in Oakland, California. The following year, he completed his novitiate in Detroit and professed his vows in 1985, moving then to Toronto to continue his seminary formation. Father was ordained a priest by Bishop Sabatini in 1990 at Holy Name Parish here in Vancouver, where he is now the assistant pastor. His Basilian appointments throughout North America have been in parish ministry and university campus ministry. In 19, in, sorry, sorry, in 2018, he completed his studies in canon law at the University of St. Paul's in Ottawa and returned home here in Vancouver to serve 
in our regional marriage tribunal as defender of the bond among other responsibilities. I have the great privilege of uh, working with Father and meeting him in the corridor, having wonderful conversation and really growing in appreciation for his presence here at the pastoral center with us. As a West Coaster, Father enjoys the outdoors, downhill skiing and biking, kayaking and camping. And as I mentioned, Father is currently the assistant pastor at Holy Name Parish, but he is about to move to his new appointment as the assistant pastor at St. Francis de Sales Parish in Burnaby. So without further ado, we welcome Father Mark Gazin, and we look forward to his talk, St. Joseph, Myth, or Menthor. Welcome, Father Mark, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Sister Angela Marie. Thank you for that very thoughtful presentation and introduction. Uh, to those of you who are watching, um, uh, good evening. And uh, as Sister Angela Marie said, um, I'm glad you're here with me and not out in the sunshine right now. Uh, when I was asked to give this presentation on the year of St. Joseph uh, in preparation for the 154th anniversary of Canada's Canada Day celebrations, I, I began thinking about the husband of Mary and the foster father of the child Jesus, uh, that they might be seen as good mentors for us as modern Canadians. And about a month ago, as I was reflecting on our, how our society is trying to erase the differences between men and women, and it, it's kind of a denial of uh, how men and women both contribute their differences to the joy of being human. However, as you know, with the Tukumlips uh, Tishwabam Indigenous Tribes revelation of 215 graves of children buried in the Kamloops residential school area, and then now with the discovery of 751 graves at the Kawas First Nation, just east of Regina, maybe like me, you also are feeling very sad and perhaps quite numb. These terribly sad revelations are drawing our attention to the sorrow and the grief, not only from the Indigenous community here in British Columbia, but from all across Canada. It has highlighted not only the generational pain and the sorrow and the suffering of Indigenous peoples and the legacy of residential schools, but also the not so subtle racism that many have experienced in our country. Chief Roseanne Kazmir of the Tukumlips Tishkwabam tribe said on uh, uh, June the 17th that there is a lot of shared hurts and traumas and triggers that have been opened. And that is something I did not anticipate. I know it's something we will all have to face. And that quote was from the Vancouver Sun. Chief Cadmus Delorme in Saskatchewan said, we are not asking for pity. We are asking for understanding. And a Musqueam tribe high school friend of mine with whom I had dinner last weekend told me that the revelation in Kamloops reopened wounds of grief and sorrow. And I told him and the greater indigenous community that they are not alone. He and they are not alone in their grief. This presentation has gone through 10 or 12 drafts in the last two weeks. And I've been reflecting on St. Joseph and his holy role for us modern day Catholics. Also, I'm trying to walk a fine line between the search for historical truth about these painful recent discoveries. Many of our First Nations brothers and sisters are practicing Catholics. The Canadian Truth and Reconciliation website provides accurate history and knowledge from the First Nations peoples, the federal government, and the churches in contrast to the media's momentary sensationalism. From the website of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I learned that the Indian residential schools were started by the federal government in the 1870s. And the federal government's goal was to assimilate the indigenous community into the dominant European culture at that time. We should probably ask ourselves, what was going on during those years? During the first five years of the 1880s, the federal government contracted to build the transcontinental railway to bring the Western colonies of British Columbia, Vancouver Island, and at that time, the, the Northwest Territories of Alberta and Saskatchewan 
into confederation. The federal government must have been under considerable financial strain and mandated religious communities to build, maintain, and administer these schools. Government agents scooped the children up from their families and placed them in these residential schools run by the Anglican Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, and various Catholic dioceses and Catholic religious communities. The Kamloops Indian Residential School operated from 1890 to 1969, mostly under the Catholic religious congregation called the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. Little has been publicly reported about the epidemics of smallpox and measles, polio and tuberculosis, let alone the Spanish flu, pandemic of about 100 years ago. These diseases were rampant in the close quarters of the residential schools. The Canadian Medical Association Journal reported that in 1904, Dr. Peter Bryce, Canada's first chief medical officer, began a systematic collection of health statistics of the several hundred Indian bands across Canada. In 1907, Dr. Bryce released a report drawing attention to the fact that according to his surveys, roughly one quarter of the indigenous children attending residential schools had died from tuberculosis. This research article goes on to say that Dr. Bryce said that the healthcare funding granted to citizens in Ottawa alone was three times higher than that allocated to the First Nations peoples in all of Canada. When Duncan Campbell Scott became the Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs in 1913, he informed Dr. Bryce that his annual medical reports on tuberculosis in the residential schools were no longer necessary, given that the information was costly to produce, and the department had no intention of acting upon it. As you can see in this quote from Mr. Scott, he was dedicated to the assimilation of Indigenous peoples at any cost. For its last nine years, the Kamloops Residential School operated under the federal government as a day school until it closed in 1978. There is another side to the residential school question, which is not being presented today. J. Fraser Field, who has a master's degree in counseling psychology, wrote to the Vancouver Sun in 1996 that it is a well-known fact that epidemics of tuberculosis had a devastating effect on native populations, especially in the close quarters of residential settings where the disease could spread easily. To jump to the conclusion that the high mortality rate of children in residential schools was a consequence of uncaring neglect in slum conditions contradicts the truth about many of these schools. He goes on in quote, while shocking individual cases of abuse can be horrific, it would be wrong to suggest that this kind of treatment was the norm. In most cases, discipline in the residential schools was on par with what was being administered in private schools of the period. In fact, a quite a number of schools, considerable sensitivity was being displayed both to the children and their native cultures. And many missionaries resisted the government's policy of assimilation. I begin this reflection and presentation on St. Joseph with these historical facts and reflections and questions. And to quote Chief Cadmus Delorme in Saskatchewan, not to garner pity, but to grow in understanding about these sad revelations. St. Joseph is the patron saint of this country that we call Canada. Canada, her name probably uh, coming from the Huron Iroquois word Kanata, which means village or settlement. And the word was first heard by the French explorer Jacques Cartier in 16, uh, 1535 by two indigenous youths who were referring to the, the village of Stadacona which is present day Quebec City. On July 1st, our country with an indigenous name will soberly recall 154 years of confederation. 
when I mentioned uh, to a Jesuit friend, yes, I do have a Jesuit friend and colleague in Australia that I had been asked to give this presentation on the year of St. Joseph, he commented that coping with the limited amount of scriptural source material will pose a real challenge. And he suggested that I could have long spaces of downtime and put up a hidden life sign on the back of the screen. Well, you know, predictably, he's right. There isn't much scriptural source material about the human father of Jesus. It's true, there is very limited scriptural uh, material about St. Joseph. Most of our knowledge comes from him, from the famous infant, infancy narratives at the beginning of the Gospels of St. Matthew and St. Luke. St. Matthew only mentions him by name, I think, about three times. St. Luke, about five times. In St. Matthew, Luke takes the lead in protecting his young family. Luke's dreams, sorry, Joseph's dreams play an important part in uh, protecting the Holy Family. And he listens to his dreams. He takes them to Egyptian safety, away from King Herod's violent raging. St. Joseph opens to divine guidance. He, he's open to divine guidance. And it recurs several other times during the narrative accounts of Jesus's infancy. During the persecution by Herod, the angel of the Lord warned Joseph to flee with the child Jesus and his mother to Egypt, remaining there until the death of Herod. Look at this beautiful picture painting by Luke Olivier Merson, which I take from Archbishop uh, Terence Prendergast's uh, blog spot. It's called Rest on the Flight into Egypt. Archbishop Terence Prendergast of Ottawa says one should not conclude from these texts that Joseph is merely an Ottoman going through the motions demanded by angelic command. When the Holy Family is told to return, they're told that it's safe to return from exile upon Herod's death in 4 BC, Joseph learns that the ruthless Archelaus had succeeded his father Herod as ruler in Judea, Samaria, and Idumea, the southern part of Israel. Joseph decided to settle in the more northern reaches of the realm, which were presided over by a more benign tetrarch, Herod Antipas. Joseph's prudential decision then explains for St. Matthew how Jesus came to be associated with Nazareth in Galilee. As a mentor for us modern Catholics, St. Joseph carefully discerned what is the right thing to do in the face of complex and difficult and possibly violent situations. St. Joseph was chosen to be the foster father of the child Jesus because he was a faithful Jew. He was devout in his prayer life and gave full and immediate obedience to God. Think about it. Would a lukewarm Jew have believed that his fiancé's unborn child was the son of God? Would a lukewarm Jew have taken the angel's warning in his dream as truth instead of dismissing it as some weird dreams that he had had? No, God chose a man that, despite being an ordinary sinner like us, he could raise Jesus to be a man on fire for the Lord. He knew St. Joseph would be a good example for chastity, work ethic, honoring Mother Mary, patience, self-control, and love of the Lord. Excellent virtues to imitate. Since Jesus was fully man and fully God, his fatherhood figure must have played a part, a part in making him the man he was on earth. In the Garden of Gethsemane, his divinity kept him from running away from his death. After all, Jesus loves us and came to die for us. But his humanity still had him acknowledge the fear of the pain and suffering to come. Who taught Jesus to stick to his commitments, even in the face of fear? Who taught Jesus to sacrificially offer his own wants? for the love of those around him? Who taught Jesus 
to defend his bride, the church, to be an example when all others ran away to hide, good and holy Saint Joseph did. During these sad and painful revelations of the residential schools, and I'm sure there are more to come, where emotions seem to overtake the search for truth, Saint Joseph is a good role model, not only for our indigenous brothers and sisters who have endured already many decades, years, perhaps centuries of suffering, but also for us non-Indigenous Canadians who struggle with current difficulties, instability, sorrow. St. Joseph is a man of strong faith in the face of uncertainty and poverty. Mary Eberstad has recently published an article called The Fury of the Fatherless in the December 2020 issue of the magazine, The First Things. She presents a theory of why we are experiencing a crisis of fatherhood in the Western world. She writes, the explosive events of 2020 are but the latest eruption along a fault line running through our already unstable lives. That eruption exposes the threefold crisis of filial attachment that has beset the Western world for more than half a century. Deprived of small f father, capital F father, and patria, a critical mass of humanity has become socially dysfunctional on a scale not seen before. This is especially true of the young. Mary Eberstard goes on to write, and I quote, six decades of social science have established that the most efficient way to increase dysfunction is to increase fatherlessness. And this the United States has done for two generations now, almost one in four children today grows up without a father in the home. For African Americans, it is some 65% of children. She goes on to write, what is happening in America is an excruciatingly painful truth that life without small f father, capital F father, and filial piety toward country are not the socially neutral options that contemporary liberalism holds them to be. The sinkhole into which all three have collapsed is now a public hazard. The threefold crisis of paternity is depriving many young people, especially young men, of the reasons to live as rational and productive citizens. Although she writes about the American social sphere, I think you and I can easily extrapolate this to our Canadian social scene. I want to draw your attention to this article because those Christian women and men who come from stable families will be living in an increasingly difficult society. There are many who long for stable stability in life. The crisis of drug addiction and gangland membership are visible signs of the collapse of the family and the hazard of fatherlessness. The church's sacraments all have examples in secular society. For example, baptism and societal membership. For example, the Eucharist and the gathering of the family for a meal. For example, the consolation of the anointing of the sick and medical healing. It's one reason why the sacrament of ordination is often called holy orders, to create order in the church. What is the basic building block of stability in, the, in, in society, in the secular world? It's the family. St. Joseph lived in unstable times. His dreams, recounted in the Gospel of St. Matthew, show him to exercise stability for the safety of the Holy Family. And the church holds him up as a mentor who prayed and who listened. And as I was taught in the seminary, to read the signs of the times. St. Joseph is an excellent mentor for fathers, for priests, especially those who are recently ordained. In the Gospel of Luke, the emphasis is more on Mary and less on Joseph. Think of the gospel proclamations during the Christmas season. 
Maybe you recall that soliloquy of Linus in the Peanuts cartoon reciting from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then Linus, he goes on to say, it goes on with the address of the angels to the shepherds, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Hmm. Now that I think about it, Linus neglects to mention Joseph, let alone Mary. But in Linus's defense, the gospels are really all about the life, and the death, and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Holy Saint Joseph is silent and supportive in the story, but he exhibits noble strength and practical wisdom. And the Gospels of St. Mark and St. John allude to Jesus as the son of a carpenter from Nazareth, but they don't mention Joseph by name. And these Gospels avoid any references to the birth of Jesus and subsequently to St. Joseph. In all four Gospels, St. Joseph is truly a silent figure. Not one of the Gospels record a spoken word or spoken verse for him. So what to do? Well, our Catholic faith is built on scripture and tradition. All that we know about St. Joseph relates to the reason for the Gospels in the first place, the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The 12 apostles evangelized, and they preached this Paschal mystery that we celebrate with every Eucharist or Mass, and even more intensely with the three days of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. As an adult, Jesus called the apostles and other disciples to follow him some 30 years after his birth. Jesus called his disciples to learn to walk by faith. St. Thomas, colloqu colloquially known as the Doubting Thomas is an example of someone who learned to walk by faith and not by sight. Like all of us who lived some two millennia after the resurrection, the apostles had a firsthand experience of the teaching and the resurrection of the rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. Those first evangelized Christians were Jews. They gathered in worship every Saturday in the synagogue on the last day of the week which was commanded by the Mosaic law as a day of rest, because God rested on the seventh day. So it was here that they began, or that they listened to the Hebrew scriptures, those first five books of the Bible, often called the Torah, the Psalms. They'd listen to various prophets, such as Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah. St. Joseph would have exercised his fatherly role by taking his family to the synagogue. And that's where the child Jesus would have heard those famous words of Micah, chapter six, verse eight. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Some 30 to 40 years after St. Joseph's fatherly role in teaching Jesus, Jewish Christians on the first day of the week would gather in homes to celebrate the Eucharist. Do this in remembrance of me, as Jesus said at the Last Supper. And they would remember Jesus's resurrection on Sunday. Over the years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, St. Paul wrote letters to these new Christian communities in Rome and Corinth and Ephesus and other cities. The Acts of the Apostles describe what happened and that these Jewish followers of Jesus were joined by non-Jewish followers, Gentiles like you and me. St. Paul's letters were kept and read and reread as he tried to support and build up these communities, these faith communities across the Mediterranean. And people began wondering about the origins of Jesus. Gradually, unique writings called Gospels were written. It's important to emphasize that the Gospels that we now read were all written within the human lifetime after Jesus' death and resurrection. As perhaps you know, the earliest and the shortest one is the Gospel of St. Mark. 
The Gospels that we have in our Bibles today were all written, as I said, within a human lifetime after Jesus' death and resurrection. Biblical archaeological research and evidence has discovered that the average size of an ancient New Testament manuscript is 450 pages. There are over 5,800 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, with over 2.6 million pages of text. And that's not counting the New Testament manuscripts written in other languages. The earliest New Testament manuscripts are stored in England. And guess where else? The Vatican. No other ancient text can compare with the New Testament. And when it comes to the sheer volume of manuscripts, we know more about Jesus and his family than we know about Ju Julius Caesar. Okay, the reason for all of this background is simply to lay a foundation for scripture and tradition. In reflecting on St. Joseph, theologians will distinguish between, you know, capital T tradition and small t tradition. For example, it is a capital T tradition that we believe Jesus is fully human and fully divine. We summarize some of those capital T traditions when we profess our faith using the apostles or the Nicene Creed. Small t traditions stem from devotional practice and ancient evidence gathered from other writings that didn't make it into the official canon of sacred scripture. So what's the connection between all this and St. Joseph? Well, when, the, when these first Christian communities were gathering and beginning to receive the Gospels, people began asking about Jesus' roots, his genealogy, his family tree, so to speak. And the Gospel writers began working backwards from the time of the Apostles preaching about the Paschal mystery, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Where did he come from? Who was he? Or as they say in the Canadian Maritimes, who's your father? The gospel writers were convinced of the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. Personally, I am convinced of the truth of the resurrection, not only because of my faith, but also because of the process of deductive logic. I cannot believe that the apostles would have gone to their deaths for a lie. All except one of the apostles were martyred. And it makes sense. It's logical that no one would put their life on the line for something that wasn't true. The present great basilica of St. Peter's in Vatican City is built over Peter's tomb and the amphitheater or circus of Nero. Those are the red lines you see. That's the circus. Um, and that's where St. Peter and St. Paul were martyred along with many other Christians. Small t tradition has it that they were falsely accused of arson by Emperor Nero. Back to that maritime question, who's your father? Three famous Catholic scripture scholars, Joseph Fitzmaier, Raymond Brown and Carol Stumuller have all written on the infancy narratives. And if you ever want an excellent study of the scriptures, even if you're starting, begin reading the Jerome Biblical Commentary. It was published in 1968. Well, there's a new one out now, and you guessed it. It's called the New Jerome Biblical Commentary for the 21st Century. It was just published last uh, December in 2020. And this commentary is essential reading for essential reading for any Catholic wanting to deepen their knowledge and understanding of sacred scripture. Pope Francis wrote the foreword for this new one. Okay, let's look at some small T traditions about St. Joseph. Canada claims to have not one patron saint, but 10. Two of them are scripture-based, St. Joseph and St. Anne. St. Joseph is certainly mentioned in the Bible, as I've already said, but St. Anne, she's part of another group of early writings that didn't make the cut in the first century church when it defined what belongs in the New Testament, what we typically call the canon or the yardstick of scripture. However, it sure makes sense that the mother of Jesus would also have a mother, eh? Jesus' grandmother. 
If you've ever visited the Basilica of St. Anne de Beaupre in Quebec, you'll understand how important extended family is. You can see in this picture, all of those narrow plots of land, all that go onto the St. Lawrence River, people were close. This sense of extended family is also very important for our Indigenous fellow Canadians. I'm sure they could teach non-Indigenous modern Canadians a thing or two about the importance of extended family life. St. Anne de Beaupre was the last stop for the fur traders on their way down the St. Lawrence River. Imagine the prayers and the veneration of St. Anne by mothers and grandmothers of those far-flung fur traders. Those women wanted the safe return of their children. The other patronal saints are the Canadian martyrs, including Jean de Brebeuf and Isaac Job. They were Jesuit missionaries in the 1600s who evangelized the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes region. These missionaries had a fervent devotion to Our Lady and Saint Joseph, when the, which they spoke of many times in the Jesuit relations. And in a letter written in May of 1635, Saint Jean de Brebeuf said, and I quote, we owe much also to our glorious Saint Joseph, spouse of Our Lady and protector of the Hurons, who has rendered us tangible aid several times. It was a remarkable thing that on the day of his feast and during the octave, accommodations came to us from all sides. In 1637, when threatened with martyrdom, Saint Jean de Brebeuf and his fellow missionaries had recourse to the great Saint Joseph. They made a vow to say masses every day for nine days in his honor, not unlike the, uh, the novena that you are doing right now. Each day passed with no threat from the Hurons, and by the time the masses had finished, they enjoyed peace again. If you're interested, the Jesuit relations can be easily purchased on Amazon.ca for about $10. Since those early missionaries, including the Recollet Franciscans, had such a strong devotion to St. Saint, uh, Joseph, he was chosen as the patron saint of Canada. Pope Urban VIII confirmed St. Joseph as Canada's patron in 1637. These 17th century missionaries had a very strong devotion to St. Joseph. Earlier, I had mentioned that the present Archbishop of Ottawa, Most Reverend Terence Prendergast, had some things to say about St. Joseph in his very well-written blog spot. At the October 2002 opening of St. Joseph High School in Barhaven, which is just south of Ottawa, the Archbishop says about St. Joseph. The New Testament depicts Joseph as a resourceful individual who earned his living as a tradesman, as a carpenter or a stonemason. He was someone who worked shaping materials. He was a person who struggled as he sought to know God's will. And once he learned God's will, Joseph did it promptly and completely, even when this disturbed his own plans. He's shown as a parent who deeply cares about Jesus, both rejoicing in awe at the marvels attending his birth and sorrowing when Jesus was lost in the Jerusalem temple. In Archbishop Terry's blog spot, actually Archbishop Terry is how he's affectionately called in Ottawa. In his blog spot, he shares his knowledge and his devotional research about St. Joseph. And he says through that, although St. Joseph got a slow start at this foster as the foster father of Jesus, he came into his own in the devotional life of the church during the founding era of Canada as a nation. Almost without exception, the great religious figures of our nation were deeply attached to Joseph, the Jesuits, Marie de l'Incarnation, Madeleine de la Peltrie, indeed at St. Marie among the Hurons in Midland, Ontario, the Canadian martyrs dedicated their chapel to St. Joseph. In a brief conversation with the judicial vicar of our archdiocese, I learned that Canada is not the only country 
under the patronage of Saint Joseph. Father Joseph Thoile, whose roots are Vietnamese, corrected my thinking. I thought Our Lady of Lavang was the patron of Vietnam, but he informed me that Saint Joseph is the patron, first patron saint of Vietnam and of many villages in that country. Joseph is a very common baptismal name for Catholic Vietnamese Canadians. Returning to Archbishop Terry's invaluable online blog spot, he calls it the journey of a bishop, of an archbishop. It's a collection of his reflections on St. Joseph as he made his high school visits throughout the Archdiocese of Ottawa, especially in the Barhaven area where I lived during my canon law studies. And the archbishop writes, the early Canadian settlers, reverence for the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the foster father of our Lord Jesus Christ were not without effect. St. Joseph is the patron of the universal church, declared by Pius the, the IX around the very time, blessed soon to be Saint Alfred Besset, better known as Brother Andre, was entering the congregation of the Holy Cross in Montreal. His lifelong attachment to St. Joseph would little by little become manifest in what would become St. Joseph's Oratory, the largest church in the world dedicated to St. Joseph, also designated as a basilica. Archbishop Terry wrote and published his online reflection before Brother Andre was canonized by Pope Benedict on October the 17th, 2010. When I began my canon law studies in Ottawa, I made a train trip to Montreal to visit a 50-year friend with whom I've maintained a friendship that, for that long. He is, he's high Anglican, but he had never visited the oratory of St. Joseph. And if I remember, he was somewhat awestruck by the size and wonder of this basilica. As he learned about the life of St. Andre, my Anglican friend recognized his devotion to the foster father of Jesus as a healer. That's not easy for an Anglican to admit. As Archbishop Terry said, this oratory is the largest church in the world dedicated to St. Joseph, and it's right here in Canada. Well, how did the oratory come about? We need some background. Brother Andre's life spans the immediate pre- and post-Confederation years of Canada. He was born in 1845 in Lower Canada, Montreal, and he was the ninth of 13 children. Four of them died in infancy. He was baptized immediately after his birth because he was so frail, and it was uncertain whether he would live. At 12 years old, he was orphaned, and his maternal aunt and uncle raised him. His extended family took him under, his, under their wing, so to speak. These were difficult, poverty-stricken roots of a man who chose life instead of death. Some years later, Brother Andre's parish priest recognized that he had a vocation to uh, religious life. That diocesan parish priest wrote to the congregation of the Holy Cross on behalf of Brother Andre saying, I am sending a saint to your congregation. He did enter the congregation of the Holy Cross, and he completed his novitiate. But because of his poverty, his lack of education, and his frail health, he entered the community and professed his vows as a lay brother. He was assigned porter duty at the college front door at the College of Notre Dame, where he greeted and he welcomed visitors. The website of the Congregation of Holy Cross states, and I quote, many people began to experience physical healings after praying with Brother Andre, and his reputation as a healer began to spread. So many people flocked to see him that the congregation allowed him to see sick people at the trolley station across the street. Through it all, Brother Andre remained humble often seeming confused that people would lavish such praise on him because he knew that the real source of these miraculous cures was St. Joseph's intercession. His desire 
to increase devotion to St. Joseph inspired him to found a shrine to his favorite saint across the street from Notre Dame College. He saved the money he earned by giving haircuts at five cents a piece, eventually earning the $200 he needed to construct a simple structure. This shrine opened on October the 19th, 1904. And in 1909, Brother Andre was released from his duties as a doorkeeper and assigned full-time as caretaker of the Oratory of St. Joseph. When Brother Andre died in 1937, it was estimated that over a million people braved the frigid January cold to file past his body laid out in state at the Oratory in Montreal. This humble man always recognized that it was the intervention of Saint Joseph, also a humble man, who brought about healing to a nation. A very good example and mentor for leadership in Canada, whether in family or in politics. This brings me back to the title of this presentation, Saint Joseph, Myth or Mentor? The word myth has a common secular meaning or understanding of a widely held but a false belief or idea. But you and I are men and women called not to walk by myth, but by faith. We walk not by sight, but by faith, just like Thomas the Apostle. Some 30 years before Thomas, St. Joseph was also called to walk by faith as the fatherly mentor to the Son of God. The COVID-19 pandemic over the last year and a half has created difficult times for many of us. Many Canadians are and will be experiencing unemployment. The revelation of the graves of the Indigenous children at Kamloops Residential, Kamloops Residential School and east of Regina is becoming a catalyst for a change of heart and behavior. In his response to this sad revelation, Archbishop Emeritus Sylvain Lavoie, who has spent over 35 years ministering among the Indigenous peoples of Northern Saskatchewan and Manitoba, he has this to say. In our numbness and shock, we have lost our voice so that we can experience what the Indigenous people have been experiencing for centuries with an important difference. They were innocent and powerless. We were complicit and therefore need to take responsibility. As happened to Jesus with the wounds on his hands and his feet, the scars of the process of colonization can be transformed into the sacred wounds, symbolizing the forgiveness that has taken place through the process of reconciliation. These wounds are not covered over or forgotten. On the contrary, they take on a new redemptive meaning as symbols of the love that has taken place through the process of reconciliation and the new identity of wellness, fullness of humanity and hope for the future. And what can we imitate of Saint Joseph? We can imitate his silence and his faith and his suffering. He shows us to be a model of kenosis, Greek word meaning emptying of the self. There's an image of a teacher pouring water into a full glass to educate students about how to learn. The water is spilling all over the table from the full glass. One must be empty of vanity to receive humility. St. Joseph is the kind of model of integrity and behavior we need in our modern times. St. Joseph is such a mentor. He had a profound awareness of the presence of the Creator and his love for all of humanity through the gift of his adopted son. Good St. Joseph, guide us and help us to choose wisely and prudently and faithfully. Please join with me in this concluding prayer to St. Joseph, which is being published in our Archdiocese of Vancouver. Hail, guardian of the Redeemer, 
spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to you God entrusted his only son. In you, Mary placed her trust. With you, Christ learned to be man. Blessed Joseph, to us also, show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace, mercy, and courage, and defend us from every evil. Amen. We humbly and soberly ask these things of you, O Lord, as we draw close to the 154th anniversary of our Canadian Confederation. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father Mark, thank you so very much for this wonderful um, lecture that you have given us on St. Joseph, a myth or mentor. I truly appreciated uh, the historical background, not being uh, Canadian myself and really falling in love with the Canadian culture and especially with our Vancouver diocese. It's such a, um, an amazing experience to learn from people who were born here and who know the history. And of course, your uh, great knowledge, not only of the history of your country, but also of the history of our fate. So thank you very much. I was struck by the fact that you mentioned how this past weeks and probably months need to become or have become a catalyst for change for us and how we need such a behavioral change in our society. And that St. Joseph can really be that mentor for us and um, a man of integrity, of humility, um, a man that we can all imitate in our day-to-day -day choices and in the way that we embrace the events of our life and especially as we um, strive to um, make our fate the catalyst for change, to make our choices and our decisions according to uh, who we are as Catholic Christians in our society and especially in Canada. So thank you so very much uh, for all that you shared with us. Um, and Father is uh, willing to take some questions. If there are any, please um, write them in the Q&A box that you find um, and we'll address some of those questions if there are any. I have to say, I'm, I'm truly amazed that there's about 178 people who are actually yes. participating. And I think that is just incredible on a beautiful sunny afternoon like this on a, on a Friday in June, so. Absolutely, yes. Oh, there's a question there. Yeah, it's just a, a, an affirmation. I enjoyed listening to the introduction, oh. very interesting. So okay. thank you for being with us tonight, whomever yeah. the attendee is. Um, yeah, any thoughts or questions for Father? Or is father is there anything else that you might like to elaborate a little um well just just to say that uh, much of this presentation that i gave um I've, I've i tried to do some research and use a lot of things on the internet and particularly if you get a chance to go to um archbishop terry uh, archbishop terry uh, father Ter archbishop terence prendergast of the archdiocese of ottawa i think he's he's just retiring now but uh that um that blog spot that he has online is an excellent source. And there are lots of sources, but uh, his is, is reflective. And I, you, I took a lot from his, um, from his blog spot. Yeah, maybe a uh, father, I could, um, a lot of people throughout the Archdiocese have been doing the consecration to St. Joseph. And now we're praying the Novena leading up to Canada Day with, um, a blessing and an act of entrustment that um, the Archbishop or Father Gary on behalf of the Archbishop will do for the Archdiocese. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to be um, consecrated to St. Joseph? Um, well, you know, the word consecration just means to be made holy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when somebody is seeking to be consecrated to St. Joseph or, you know, any form of consecration, it's it's it, it's kind of I, I'm sort of speaking off the top of my head here, but mm -hmm. I think it has to do with the desire to imitate the one you're consecrated, being consecrated to. So you know, Saint Joseph doesn't mean that we just uh, never say anything. Although there are lots of people who may find it difficult to speak up to defend their faith or defend their 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 religion or anything like that, but um, it, it, it's being open to the Holy Spirit working through St. Joseph. And so I think a consecration is about being made holy so that we can imitate 
uh, this excellent role model. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so there are a few questions coming in. Did oh, Joseph Mary. have any children uh, before Mary? I'm sorry? Did Joseph have any children before Mary? Well, uh, the scriptures are pretty silent about that. <clears throat> There's not, I, we don't know. Um, but I think, I think I would put it this way. We call St. Joseph a saint. We call him a holy man. And so to have any relations and have children outside of marriage would just sort of not be holy. You know, that's not, that's not what St. Joseph would have done. So, you know, we, we know next to nothing historically about these things, but, but we do, we can trust uh, the church. We can trust the church's teaching, the church's, you know, two millennia of teaching about these things, that there's truth in the fact that he probably did not have any children. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. And another question will be, how do you think the church will go forward giving its, given its role in the residential school in Canada? financially, legally, and most of all, Catholics themselves will continue to be part of the church. Well, of the about 900,000 um, Indigenous peoples in Canada, uh, 600,000 of them are Catholic. And with these revelations and this sorrow, uh, one of the things I, I mentioned and I quoted, uh, it was... I felt it very important to quote some of the chiefs, especially the chief uh, up in uh, Kamloops uh, of the, uh, sorry, I have troubles pronouncing the name of their, their, um, their tribe, and, and also the chief that is uh, in uh, Saskatchewan. He said that they're, they don't want pity. Mm -hmm. They want understanding. And so the whole truth and reconciliation process for us as Catholics, even for us who are not Indigenous, is about understanding. Um, you know, I, I have a, a high school friend who is from Musqueam, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we got together for dinner at my brother's place uh, um, for Father's Day, <laughs> um, and um, I don't have children, <laughs> uh, but I am a father. And so my brother recognized that and, and, and Jay, well, I didn't want to say his name, but anyway, uh, we, we got together and we listened, we listened to what he had to say. And I think that's what we need to do when it comes to finances. Uh, you know, that's, I think that's the role of, of bishops to deal with those kinds of issues. Um, I think we have to remember that many of these graves that have been discovered through ground penetrating radar, uh, many of these graves come from, you know, maybe a hundred years ago. I think where the church should exercise sorrow and apology very seriously is that many of these graves were unmarked. And for some reason, the people the, the priests, the nuns, the, the religious brothers, the, the bishops, whoever was in, who was looking after these schools at the time, uh, they should have contacted the parents. They should have done that. And that was not done. Mm -hmm. So these are things that uh, we're not, we're all sorry for. We're all sorrow, sorrowful for. Thank you, Father Mark. Um, why do you think, uh, the Holy Father seems to be, um, is, is not apologizing. So, and what would you say to the many people who demand that apology uh, from the Holy Father? I know that that was one of the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was um, a call to request uh, a, uh, an apology from, from the Pope. Um, since then, there's been two popes. Uh, Pope Benedict did express sorrow uh, when he met with Aboriginal Indigenous peoples. Uh, I, I forget what year it was, uh, but it, it happened shortly. You know, I, I forget the year. But um, at the present time, the, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops um, is organizing or has organized and will be 
uh, indigenous peoples will be going to see Pope Francis this year. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of time and effort to make these things happen. Um, Pope Francis has expressed sorrow for, and I, I don't know his exact words, but he has expressed incredible sorrow for the harm that has come to indigenous peoples in North and South America. Um, you have to remember the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Um, our Bishop is Michael Miller here in Vancouver. Uh, he's our apostle, he's our leader of the territory we call the Archdiocese of Vancouver. Um, and there are, I, I forget how many, there's uh, uh, 70, I think there's 74 dioceses across Canada, all with a leader. Uh, the Catholic Church is not a monument or a, 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 um, a monolithic group. There is no such thing as the Catholic Church of Canada. It doesn't exist. Uh, there are 74 dioceses across Canada, all with their own structure and, and so on. And the, the bishops come together in what we call the, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. And so uh, the Pope respects that authority. Yes, the Pope is the first among equals as a bishop. Um, he is the one that brings unity. He's trying to bring unity uh, throughout the world. Um, and I have, I know that Pope Francis very much wants to apologize. And so this um, delegation of um, indigenous uh, leaders uh, going to the Vatican this year, I don't know the dates or anything, but uh, I, I believe that that will happen. There will be an apology. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Um... So here's a comment and a question. Thank you, Father. Our attendee says, this was a wonderful presentation and I think we all have learned so much about St. Joseph this year. We're so blessed. For those of us non-Indigenous Catholics, how can we better allies with our First Nations brothers and sisters now? And how do we respond to the attacks towards the Catholic Church? And as a Catholic, how do we lovingly defend our faith in the face of all this, especially in the spirit of truth and reconciliation? Well, the beginning of any truth or reconciliation has to begin in one's own heart. Um, it begins in one's own family. Um, learning to forgive, even when it's hard, and I, I know from my own family experience, there are many times where we had to, we've had to really work hard at reconciliation. Um, <clears throat> I think you learn these, these, you learn these things which are part and parcel of being a Catholic and being a Christian, which is about being a person of reconciliation. So that's where it starts. If you encounter someone, you have to remember, you know, Aboriginal people or Indigenous people. They're just like you and me <clears throat> in the sense of um, they know wrong, they know right, they know sin. They, like you and me, they're Catholics. And uh, I think the call is to keep moving forward. And this is where I think St. Joseph is a good role model because when things were really tough, he taught his son, the son of God, Jesus, uh, not to give up. And I think you know, we, we cannot give up, um, even when it's hard. And sometimes you just have to listen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me see. Um, so Father, our Antony says, you introduced Joseph as the healer, as opposed to the, to the earthly father, the obedient facilitator, the fixer. You make Joseph more proactive rather than reactive. Is that <laughs> what he he's trying to clarify his understanding of your definition of Joseph there? Well, uh, I think Joseph is a healer, um, you know, because I I, I trust uh, Brother Andre, Saint Andre. Uh, you know, his feast day is on January the 6th. And, 
you know, and Brother Andre had an incredible devotion, a very simple man, you know, he, 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 would, humi- he would humble me. I, I'm not a, I don't feel like a simple man very often, but uh, St. Joseph, uh, sorry, St. Saint, uh, Saint Brother Andre, St. Andre, um, he recognized the healing power of Joseph. And when I talk about healing, I think, um, you know, who communicated to the human side or the human part of who Jesus was, who communicated to him about bringing the marginalized back into the community? And that's what Jesus did. He was constantly bringing the tax collectors. He was bringing the prostitutes. He was bringing the people who had lepers, all of those people who were uh, ostracized and marginalized. And so you and I, I think when we imitate Joseph in that sense, draw, can draw people back into the community. And that is the penultimate, I think, form of healing which is uh, bringing people back into, into the faith community. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I was wondering where we can find the historical information you gave us on residential schools. Uh, we would like to share it with others. Um, so if there is a sense of where those can be found. And what we can do, if you have some resources, Father, we will be sending out next week the recording of Father's presentation through an email. And if there are any resources that Father has for you, we can add it to the email so you might have it. Uh, in, my, in doing the research that I did to prepare this talk, <clears throat> I used the, um, the, the, the Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, website. Uh, to to gather information. Um, As as I journeyed through and began putting these things together, um, I I used my own common sense in terms of uh, what is true and what isn't true, at least trying to figure out what is being said in the news media, the newspapers, um, the... the, um, As I did a little bit of research online, I, I began asking questions about um, what was really happening at that time. And so that's when, you know, I learned uh, more. I, I, when I was in elementary school and high school, I learned about the transcontinental railway and, and, and you know, the building of Canada as, as a country and things like that. Um, but I also learned about uh, the, first, um, the, the first Canadian um, health uh, director, uh, Dr. Peter Bryce. And I also learned about uh, Mr. Uh, Duncan uh, McDonald Scott, or that is a name the wrong, other way around. Uh, but anyway, I was shocked when I saw that quote, and I and I I did more research to try and see was that a real quote, and it and it really was. He was dedicated to the assimilation of um, Indigenous peoples. So for you know to do research, <clears throat> uh, you know. I, I, I think my um, my paper. I, I wrote this out, and I have I have all my um, uh, footnotes and things like that. So maybe uh, I can give that to uh, Sister Angela Marie, and she could put it up somewhere, and then you can kind of find these these areas online as well. So it's a little hard to communicate it through this medium, the footnotes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much, Father. So next week we will be sending out um, the recording and then some resources. And thank you, Father, for offering also um, your paper that we will add to the email. Um, so I'd like to extend my deep gratitude for Father Gizen for being here with us tonight for his wonderful presentation. I've learned a lot. And as some of our attendees have mentioned, this has been a wonderful opportunity for us to learn more about St. Joseph. And it's a learning that um, we pray we'll move from the intellect to the heart and to our day-to-day actions and how truly St. Joseph can inspire us to be more reflective, uh, to act more promptly when God calls, uh, to be more attentive to the needs of others, to be greater servants in our church, uh, to be an instrument of healing for others and to reach out to all in need. 
and of course also to grow in our own prayer life. Um, Saint Joseph, when I met, was a man of prayer. So, thank you for inspiring us tonight. And I'd like you to stay with us for a couple of more minutes as we go through some of the upcoming events. And Father Gizen will give us a final blessing um, at the end of that. Uh, very good. So coming up next week on July 1st, we'll be celebrating uh, Canada Day together. So we invite you to join us for the Canada Day Mass and entrustment to St. Joseph. The Mass will be celebrated by Father Gary Franken, the Vicar General of our Archdiocese, on behalf of Archbishop Miller that, as you know, is recovering from his throat surgery and doing very well. And so please join us. The cathedral will be open for limited seating. Uh, but the Mass is also uh, being live streamed. And the Novena, if you have not signed up and you'd like to, to join us for the next few days, um, will end on uh, the day before, so Wednesday uh, the 30th. A great opportunity for us to celebrate as Canadians and to entrust ourselves to St. Joseph. And then we move to our next event. Uh, we, with great joy, um, the Archdiocese has announced the ordination of Deacon Raffaele Salvino to the priesthood. So the Archbishop on July 3rd will ordain um, Deacon Raffaele. So please pray for him leading up to this wonderful and important moment. And also join us for the celebration via live stream. Like he will be ordained on July 3rd at of noon at the cathedral. So pray for Deacon Raphael and join us in celebration. Uh, the next event will be Mariopolis. This is the annual uh, Focolari's uh, summer gathering. So as uh, many other events, this is being held online on July 10th and July 11th. Please join Mariopolis and the Focolari community for Horizon of Hope for a New World. Uh, the Archdiocese continues to promote uh, the great work of PRH, personality and human relationship. Uh, under the realm of human formation, PRH workshops are for adults who truly want to grow in self-awareness and autonomy and who want to become better equipped to face the challenges of life. So we have three upcoming workshops, uh, the Who Am I on July 9th to 11th, Living with More Inner Balance, July 16th to the 19th. And the third and last uh, for July is Growing My Capacity to Love and Receive, July 26th and 29th. So wonderful workshops, uh, very, very fruitful. And then coming up is a wonderful initiative. And this is um, in September, but I would like to um, speak about it now because registrations will open soon, the spiritual care training program, you know how Pope Francis has challenged everyone to really think about their brothers and sisters in new ways. Many of our brothers and sisters are experiencing profound loneliness and isolation. And the spiritual care training program provides um, people with an answer to the call for reaching out to our brothers and sisters who are suffering right now. So it's a wonderful training that allows us to, to be prepared to go out um, and visit others in their homes and provide care and support uh, to know really how to journey with another who is suffering at this time. So a wonderful program that will be introduced and began will begin in September. So thank you so much for joining us. This is our last Into the Deep session for uh, before the summer, so we'll take a little summer break in August and July and August, but we will return in September. So we look forward to seeing all of you then. And again, thank you, Father Mark. And if we could please have your blessing at the end of this night. I'll keep it very simple because I think people want to go out and watch the sunset. <laughs> the Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. Good and gracious God, we praise your holy name. We thank you for the gift of life that you have given to each of us. We thank you for the gift of curiosity. We thank you for the gift of healing. We thank you for the gift of your foster father, Joseph, who is our father of healing indirectly. You, you had such a powerful influence on your son. Help us to be open to your influence in our lives. 
And I humbly ask you, Lord, for your blessing for all of us who are watching this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace Thanks to everyone. You. Peace be with you too. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Father. God bless. Bye-bye.